A very warm welcome to the EI, uh, David Soskes. Yeah. Uh, we are very happy to have you here um, to discuss about the new book that you have with uh, Tor Meyerson. Um, and we want to ask you two kinds of questions during the interview, uh, Pei and I. Um, first, we want to talk a bit about the book. And then in the second part, we would like to ask a bit about career, career advice for people working in multidisciplinary um, fields like at FEUI and what your experience is there. But maybe to start with a very general question, the book is covering a lot of ground. It's talking about capitalism, it's talking about democracy, populism, and so on. Can you give us a very brief um, introduction to the book, kind of an elevator uh, pitch, what you see as the main contribution of the book? Well, I think we, we were really interested by how um, advanced capitalist democracies work. We, we thought that there's, or that, that there obviously is a huge amount of work going on about in comparative political science alone about comparative politics and how maybe how individual countries work about all sorts of well, areas like hmm. education policy and so on. We thought very little work had been done on advanced capitalism as a whole and hmm. Wolfgang Steik wrote a article which I sort of felt at the time it was meant to provoke Peter Hall and myself, where, which was entitled um, something like Varieties of Capitalism, question mark, a pluribus mm -hmm. unum, yeah. out, of, out of the many one comes. And this was yeah. Wolfgang saying, they're, they're all going towards an American model. Yeah. That was that stage in his, yeah. in his career, dazzling career. Um, so I think part of what was motivating us was definitely we wanted to try and make this into a serious subject, not looking at capitalism the world over, mm -hmm. because obviously there's a huge amount of work done on yeah. the developing world and yeah. how, but how capitalism works in the developing, developing world, but how capitalism works in the advanced world. So that was definitely a major push um, behind uh, wanting to, to write the book. We worked a lot on ourselves, obviously, from my background, working on variety of capitalism mm -hmm. and then working on, with Torben on comparative inequality redistribution yeah. uh, and, and so on. So we wanted this to be, to try and shift the debate. But I think part of the reason for trying to shift the debate was the nature of criticism of advanced capitalism over the past 15 years or so mm. with the development with the financial crash with the big slowdown in activity slow growth of real wages the development of populism mm. evidently and a big, I'd say quite sort of left-wing um, push of a pretty critical sort about whether advanced capitalism, A, was going to survive, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. whatever Wolfgang's marvellous title was, not, yeah. uh, not if but when, yeah. and um, then beyond that the, the question of should mm. advanced capitalism Survive, and this took us back to the debates in the 1930s, when the um, when on the one hand you had, say, Bernstein, mm -hmm. and indeed you had you had. I mean, although Bernstein was to the theoretical uh, analyst who was most concerned with countering the Marxist critique that it was all you had to do in Germany was wait yeah. and then sooner or later this the revolution would come so yeah. you had Engels this whole great row of Engels and then Kautsky uh, and indeed Hilferding and people like that who were 
as it were, defenders of the of the, the left Marxist mm -hmm. tradition in the in social democracy that uh, just wait and it will it will happen. Don't try and don't try and do deals with the don't try and move towards the centre of the stage. Don't try and you don't even need to you don't even need to attack mm. uh, Nazism or you just gotta wait and it will it will happen. So I think <laughs> I don't mean to say that say Wolfgang, I am sounding a bit obsessed by Wolfgang, but that's <laughs> partly because partly because uh, he he's uh, he's an old friend and I partly because I admire him a great deal and partly because I'm quite dazzled by his yeah. by his work. But um, I think we went back to the 1930s, the 1920s actually start with, and then the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And I think we look quite carefully at these, at these debates to, to see what role critical discussion mm -hmm. could play. There's a, there's, a, there's a very good book by Sherry Berman uh, on social democracy, which I was quite influenced by later on actually, not so much when we were actually writing the, the book. But those were the reasons why we were at least sceptical about the sort of really big bang mm -hmm. attacks on, um, on advanced capitalism, the whole occupation movement and, and so on and so on and so forth. Um, and um, when we looked at the data on uh, advanced capitalism, mm. what we what we saw was obviously something which is very, very well known to everyone, that advanced capitalism had been massively successful mm. in raising living standards, pulling pulling most people out of from the late nineteenth century, pulling a large portion of the population out of poverty. And more interesting still, when we look at the actual inequality data, mm. both the market Gini coefficient, but above all the degree of redistribution which takes place um, with what well, once democracy starts, something to discuss with you at some yeah. at some stage yeah. when all those data, when all that data <laughs> is there. Um, uh, yeah. uh, we were very struck, actually, by the fact that yeah, advanced capitalism seems to to work really well in mm. raising living standards and in a, a relatively relatively any other system, any other sort of durable system, yeah. uh, uh, do, doing that in a, in a relatively egalitarian type of way. But I think he, with that went the thought which very much distanced us from say. An American type of celebratory capitalist mm. approach, which was, we saw more and more clearly how totally integrated advanced capitalist systems were into the advanced nation state. So that this was not advanced capitalism we're talking about actually, because it was advanced capitalism embedded in nation states. Mm. Which could see the direction to push advanced capitalism. So those were that's yeah. um, that sort of where we got. I think the other thing to say is we were. Um, do you want to go on, or do you want to stop? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, I think it's a very good introduction because uh, what I really liked about the book is um, yeah, especially this uh, kind of intellectual history that you point where um, capitalism is surprisingly stable. Yeah. hand in hand with democracy and that's then the puzzle that you address from several aspects and we had a range of questions first one on on timing history that sort of thing i wanted to but could, could i say one yeah. further I mean, the, the yeah, one sure. first thing i want to say was and i was going to try and talk about it this evening so capitalism advanced capitalism mm -hmm. in the advanced democracies is remarkably durable we that we took we we actually looked and we saw you, you go back to 1920s after the First World War when all yeah. these countries are, are democracies and you go on to, as it were, 2019 mm -hmm. and all those countries have remained democracies, yeah. remained advanced capitalist democracies, with the sole exception of Czechoslovakia for yeah. obvious reasons. 
and moreover, that's a these are systems which persist right through that time, with the evident exception of 1935 to 19 to 1945. But this was extraordinary durability of extraordinary resilience, and yet when you look at the this is the title of the book, Turbulence. Mm. The turbulence which is going on during this 100 year period uh, of wars, of great financial crises, of long term, long term recessions, depression, of massive technological mm. change, of the whole of decolonialization happens from the, through the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, yeah. And then communism rises at the start of this century and then comes down before the end of the century. Mm. So this is an incredibly turbulent period. And yet, the vast capitalist democracies as a system remain remarkably, remarkably stable. stable. Uh, but, but, but a lot of what I've been doing since has been actually looking at these technology regime changes mm -hmm. and seeing a how powerful technology regime changes in enabling these huge innovations to take place, b how really destabilizing technological regime changes. And if we have time to mm -hmm. talk about either today or tomorrow, I want to really talk about the how populism how you get populist movements actually at each stage when you have a crisis of technology regime change, whether it's the late, the late 19th century, the whole of populism developing in the, in the United States, uh, where, whether you have the 1930s, where, where one talks about that as, as populism, but basically it is a populist reaction, and whether, and then of course from the, after the, after the 2007 crash and mm. what I see as a sort of transfer from Fordism to or the longer term effects of the transfer yeah. from Fordism to knowledge economy. So mm. it's not that we're not saying that it, advanced capitalism in this advanced national context is both unbelievably durable but at the same time incredibly inherently yeah. unstable. Yeah. And Schumpeter was right about it. Schumpeter was wrong in thinking that it was he thought it was going to collapse. Yeah. But he was right in, in understanding what the, the nature of the instability of creative destruction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we will uh, come to populism definitely oh, later. Yeah, uh, but but I thought uh, I would begin uh, with asking you a bit about. Uh, so in the, in the early parts of the book, you you tie uh, the uh, the patterns of modern capitalism to historical uh, to historical patterns, uh, and uh, so what you do you. Uh, try to explain both the democratization processes and also the outcome of these processes in terms of what type of democracy that emerges. And you, uh, contrary to the existing literature, you are tying both of these developments, that when you become a democracy and what type of democracy, to a common factor. Uh, and uh, I would like you to, to explain a bit more about this, how you see uh, both the process towards democratization and uh, the shape of democracy, especially electoral system choice. Yes. Well, I think we were <coughs> so. Tom and I and um, Tom Cusack in mm. Berlin had been working on actually on P on why PR gets adopted in the in this is sort of the nineteen twenties or so, and or at least the first um, the first quarter of the of the uh, of the twentieth century. And so we were really interested in the distinction between um, uh, between the, the countries which then turn into coordinated market economies which by and large adopt a PR system and um, and the Anglo Saxon countries mm. which by and large stay with the majoritarian system. So we were very interested in why that was the case. And then we're interested, then going back from that, we were interested in um, how, did, how did democracy develop in, during this period? This is, for, for a lot of the coordinating market economies, is when democracy is really developing 
that from the sort of end of the 19th century mm. to the to the 1930s, something something like that. Uh, and it obviously precedes that in um, the UK and uh, the UK and the US, and um, and indeed um, the UK imposes democracy with very commas on the so-called white settler countries, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, quite quite early on. So the question was, which we were interested in, was um, why does why does why does democracy develop so early and so relatively easily in the Anglo-Saxon world? That's to say, there were no major democracy wasn't the result of wasn't really the result of major revolutions or mm. anything of anything of that sort. Whereas in the coordinated market economies or the Northern European economies, um, the uh, Democracy develops out of essentially out of general strikes. Actually, is the most is the most common thing, and this is what um, Collier uh, writes about in her work, distinguishing between um, democratic transitions, which, as it were, are I think she calls elite enabled, and democratic transitions, which are, are the result of some sort of um, uh, whether you call it revolutionary activity, but at any rate, strike, major strike action. So we were seeing why, why, is that, why was that the case? Because that seemed a really good way of getting into the whole history of capitalism mm. uh, debate. And what we noticed, what we pointed out, I'm not sure whether, whether this has been done before, we didn't find, um, but doubtless there are historians who have who or, uh, since it's your, I can say this as it were, to, to political scientists. Oh dear, I hope that no, hope that no, no historians are going to listen to this. But um, very, could I say they're very, very valuable people, historians. I, have not, I read them a great deal. Um, what was really interesting was the way in which the working class develops in the coordinated market economies is very much with a, uh, <coughs> a union or unions who are going for the uniform development of the working class into workers who are trained and skilled. So all of these are sort of millions of exaggerations of qualifications. By and large, the countries which became coordinated market economies start off going through a process of development of trade unions as these countries adopt more and more actually uh, more and more sophisticated uh, innovations production and so on from the late late 19th century mm. uh, on and the it's very difficult to resi resist unions because you need to have workers who've got who are tied into the into the technology, who are um, and who whose cooperation you have to have. Mm. Therefore, it's difficult to resist trade unions. And the unions' approach was then to uh, to, inst to to behave cooperatively, but to use to develop a sort of general approach of saying, yes, we'll behave cooperatively in exchange for our working force mm. becoming trained. In the process, so you see the relevance of this. What I'm saying in a short, short while. So these working classes were unified working cl classes with, as it were, very loosely single unions or single sectoral unions, um, and that meant that when you came to, to develop democracy, these people could then, these unions, or these, these social democratic mm -hmm. parties as they were, could push for redistribution which would cover the whole of the workforce. Mm -hmm. And that was a hugely, seen as a hugely expensive thing, it was a hugely expensive yeah. thing, as, the, as one can see from Scandinavia and, and, and so on. Again, your 
your work and data is awaited. Um, um, so both employers and governments were nervous about um, about democracy under those circumstances. In the Anglo-Saxon case, the working class developed in a completely separate way. It developed as a system of skilled workers who had skilled workers unions uh, who were some proportion of the working class, but let's say um, a quarter or a third of the working class, uh, and a large mass of unskilled workers mm. who included the general, the poor, generally. Um, now, with these workers, that situation, you could then go for a, if you, if you wanted to have democracy, you could have democracy with, uh, w with, uh, with majoritarian system, where the median voter would be a skilled worker, and the interest of the skilled worker would be just as much as the interest of the wealthy people not to engage in great redistribution to the poor because they have there are two sep separate interests the yeah. skilled workers interests the interest of the of the poor so in the anglo-saxon world you could you could perfectly well have an electoral system you could perfectly well have democracy based on a majoritarian electoral system which cost obviously cost Mm -hmm. Something to, to to better old people, but didn't wasn't hugely expensive or hugely dangerous. Mm -hmm. In the Northern European case, you really had to accept that democracy might be quite a dangerous mm -hmm. thing because you're now giving power to a large portion of the of the poorer part of the population, uh, and um, then what? Then what happens? Then you get uh, the um, the you then get this situation developing where going for PR is actually what the uh, what the left sees they have to do because then they can combine, as it were, the left centre of the electorate with centrist parties. Mm -hmm. And then screw the screw the rich. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you you have these two. That puts it in a yeah, yeah, yeah. oversimplified way. But that was the argument which we saw saw happen. And how is this tied to your argument about skill formation and investments in education? Because as I understand it, that's also part of the argument why why some countries extended the franchise to to a larger part of the population. Well, once you had skill, once you have skill, um, once skill becomes a key, a key variable, as it does in the, um, um, the development of skills, it, it, as the working class classes are developing over this long period from mm -hmm. the middle of the nineteenth century on to through through to the twentieth century, skill becomes a really critical. Very, it's, it's uh, and of course, um, Kathy Thielen's mm -hmm. book on the evolution of institutions is really centered on the evolution of institutions in relation to training. She sees this as, as, as this absolute critical um, policy issue and institutional issue and so on and so forth. So it's important because it determines whether or not uh, companies can develop um, really high level sophisticated innovation. Now in those days the high level sophisticated the sort of inverted from now to some extent. The high level sophisticated innovation was done in the in Northern Europe, particularly in Germany, and then later on in uh, later on in in Sweden. Mm -hmm. uh, we in the UK still uh, we were still good at producing textiles, which didn't require a huge degree of yeah. skills. Or we were good at producing things which just required and some some parts of, uh, of engineering which just required uh, high level um, uh, s s skilled workers. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in a very English way, skilled training was just left to 
companies to decide what to what to do. Mm. Um, the same was true in the United States, except that in the United States, the companies, the big companies, said, "Well, look, what we've got to do is we've got to find a way of which ultimately then turns into Fordism. We've got to find a way of really uh, using labour which isn't too skilled, of using well-trained engineers to." design processes which mm. don't require on high levels of skills. So that in that case, these workers don't need to be union, unionized. They, they, they'll just become semi-skilled workers. We can pay them less, and we can work them, we can work them hard. So you get mm. um, the, the American development is, is interesting, therefore, because all the big companies essentially used unskilled or, or semi-skilled labor in their, in their factories. They used um, engineers to design ways in which things were produced which didn't require the use of a massive amount of, of, of skills. And the skilled workers in the States, of, of whom there were many, but they, did, they, they worked as, in a more artisanal way. They were famously cigar makers mm. um, uh, or... Uh, or tailors, or they actually were some, to some extent work, worked on particular jobs in the railroad, such as famously um, Pullman, uh, um, what, whatever, Pullman, work, Pullman uh, um, railway railway workers, mm. and um, so you get in the, you get a, a much more uh, atomistic development of skills in the Anglo-Saxon world, where uh, a large amount of the time, the employees are trying to avoid ha having to deal with large amounts of skilled workers. Therefore, they use semi-skilled workers and engineers. Uh, and the skilled workers work 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 on in these relatively high, high skilled, but essentially craft areas. So there was no there was no sort of natural coalition mm. between the between the semi-skilled workers mm. and the um, uh, who eventually who eventually do unionize, but unionize in, in the CIO, the auto workers and so on, um, versus the skilled workers, the craft workers, who who unionize in the AFL unions. And for a long time, you have a divided a divided working working class. So working class politics develops in a very different way in the United States than mm -hmm. it does in Germany. So, mm. so, so from the very beginning, you have a co-evolution of how political power is structured and how labor markets. Absolutely, work. that's exactly right. Yes, absolutely, and that was what we were trying mm. to, we were trying to say. So we we so we started off. Can we write a, Can we write a book which basically says this is about the class capitalism rather than having to mention varieties? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And well, after <laughs> after quite a short time, we we we. We agreed that well, you, you have to bring variety into it. But the word "bring variety" in is to show that the political system mm. and the political economic system, the wage system, certainly the labour markets and so on, co-evolve mm. in their in the way they develop. I had a, another question exactly on this. Uh, point that you just mentioned. I took it away as one of the main um, uh, claims of the book that uh, cap or advanced capitalism supports um, advanced democracy and advanced democracy supports advanced capitalism. So we have this thing kind of going hand in hand. And one of the mechanisms is um, that there is a, a winning majority that kind of votes for, um, votes for economically competent uh, parties, economic winners if you want. I'm painting a very brief yeah. um, argument here. But where I want to get at is that this entire argument rests on the assumption that people only think economically and that they only vote on the economic dimension. And I've, I'm sure you have heard this um, question and criticism many times before, yeah, yeah. but of course I still want to raise it. So as you are well aware, there's the big uh, political behavior literature that argues um, if you want to explain people's voting behavior, we more and more need to look at the second dimension, so at the value dimension, whether people are, for example, green alternative libertarian or traditionalist or libertarian nationalistic, and that this second dimension is becoming more and more important in today's politics, 
also with the rise of populism, of course, these two co-evolve. And so the question I would like to raise is, um, what role does um, the second dimension play in your book? Because at some point you even say the knowledge or the second dimension is the most important cleavage in the knowledge economy. And at the same time, I thought I can read the entire book without knowing about the second dimension. It's all first dimension politics. So which one is it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're taking grand historical <laughs> <laughs> historical look at it. Like I don't yeah. know how um, so l let me say, but before literally answering that question, I'll, mm. I'll come on to that in just one second. Um, I think pro probably the way, if and I guess we we wrote this over quite a long period of time because we were mm. thinking and arguing about it for a long time. I think I would would say something like, look, what's going on here is uh, people may be voting for for different for different parties, but there are a lot of people who have an interest in advanced capitalism working working well. Trade. Uh, Trade unions typically mm. have trade yeah. unions have a, a strong interest in advanced capitalism working well. This doesn't mean that they will vote for a particular party, but they won't vote for a party which they see as not having uh, not having a reputation for mm. competence for serious economic management. Mm. So what we're arguing is that not necessarily that there is literally a majority and hence a majority party in favour of advanced capitalism. We're arguing that any party, if it wants to be elected, has got to show that it has mm. a high degree of competence, or its leaders are competent people in running running yeah. economies. And I think that I'll come on to the, 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 the um, second dimension yeah. thing in a, in a second, but I think that's over a long period of time that seems to be uh, one of one of the one of the things which really holds up quite well that, that voters really are concerned to vote for parties who know how to run the run the economy and running the economy increasingly means making the economy competitive uh, and so on and mm. hence focusing on the uh, advanced sectors of the or at least making sure the advanced sector of the economy is developing effectively. So. Now to come to this question of two, two dimensions. Mm. So can I say, in, in relation to that, the having a competence in managing the economy doesn't, as it were, say anything particularly about either dimension. It doesn't say you, you want to be, um, certainly on a left-right scale, mm. it sort of doesn't say anything about that. It would, would say whether you're left or right it's true, but you place a lot of salience on this dimension, right? Well, oh well. So let's look at the let's look at the um, the second dimension, whatever mm -hmm. it's called. Yeah. So first of all, I think what we want to say was that this this isn't really about culture. It's really about it comes about for um, material reasons, and the mm -hmm. second dimension then becomes um, one which, as we see, it sort of divide, divides up increasingly. Uh, graduates living in living in big cities, mm -hmm. working in the advanced sectors of the of the economy, uh, versus uh, people who um, say live outside the outside the big cities, yeah. peripheral areas, uh, are non graduates not doing so well. Though of course we actually then increasingly find that that's a, that's an Anglo-Saxon and French story. And when you look at Northern Europe, mm. uh, and you look at populism in Northern Europe, the people who vote populist I indeed geographically don't live in the big cities, but nonetheless they, by and large, from the various studies we've seen, these are people who, who are certainly not, not necessarily badly off people. Mm. They, they're actually typically in, uh, typically in sectors which were manufacturing, and the manufacturing component has been steadily going down in mm. time. Okay, I'll come and talk about that then in a second. So what uh, what I'm 
seeing in this is that it, it's um, it makes <laughs> it makes quite a, quite a difference that you have a reputation for being a good economic manager. Even people who are, as it were, populist voters want the economy to work to work well. They don't want the economy to work badly. So up to now, it's been important for uh, for different parties to have the reputation of, as it were, independently of the two dimensions, it's been important to have a reputation for not, if you want to be electable, to not screw things up as far as the economy is concerned. Now, sometimes, sometimes parties are not so interested in being elected mm -hmm. and therefore are much more open to attacking, uh, let's say, to imposing protectionism or mm -hmm. whatever it is in Trump's terms or, or Brexit. And certainly this argument at the moment doesn't apply to the UK since neither party seems to have to be said to have a good reputation for economic, for economic management. So leave aside the, the UK. Um, but I was saying in general mm. that even populist parties, so if you, if, you, if you look at, if you look for instance at the, as we were talking about the, the Greens, yeah. uh, the Greens have been, um, uh, they've obviously been very concerned to have a, a, a reputation for economic management. If you look at the AFD, the AFD indeed has also been pretty concerned when it came out, obviously came out of, mm -hmm. out of that. Now, you, you could perfectly well say the AFD needs different things in different parts of, of Germany, and it definitely has an unpleasant side to it. But it's not a party which, as it were, it, it pays a great deal of attention to, to economic policy issues. Yeah, but that's maybe, that's maybe a perfect example with the AFD, because I would totally agree that the AFD used to be founded on economic grounds mainly. So it's the alternative to an economic um, policy that we don't agree with. Let's found a new party. But over time, it has shifted away. At the moment, it's not talking a lot about the economic dimension. Call it whatever you like. Yeah. Um, it's not talking about its own economic competence. It's talking about immigration. It's talking about um, this culture being undermined. So it's discourses on the second dimension. So and then we're back to the same question. So here would be what, what I would, would say. Is I would say once the AFD gets into a situation where it wants to be a coalition partner, mm -hmm. then it has to take this mm -hmm. much more much more seriously. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, the the parties, so uh, 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 really looking at Bond Voter, but the parties, mm -hmm. the sort of key parties, they're Greens and and. Um, and CDU yeah. uh, are both deeply concerned about the about economic economic competence. Yeah. When a time arises uh, when the AFD actually wants to get into government, which will certainly will certainly come because there are a lot of ambitious politicians mm -hmm. there, then they're going to then then my guess would be that they would then start taking economics. Mm -hmm. far more seriously mm -hmm. again that, that would be my guess so that would be the, the broad sort of I mean to, 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 to this is all um, we're in the worst period from the problems mm -hmm. which have been caused by this unprecedented long recession mm -hmm. we haven't had a recession like this for a long time <coughs> And the problem with the recession is it's actually, it's, it's not so much it's affected unemployment, it hasn't affected unemployment because on the whole you've had not very good jobs being, being mm. created. What it has done has been to affect uh, the growth of real wages and the growth of productivity. That's been the big problem which we've had. And that has really undermined the system. Mm. So it's not that I don't think that things can undermine the system, lead to an oppositional populism which then doesn't behave in the way yeah. which I was was saying, uh, I think that can happen as mm. one of the big instabilities of capitalism. Very interestingly, if you go back to the 1930s, the populist leaders in the 1930s all go actually for, they're all, at that stage, they're all concerned about how do you actually manage unemployment. So yeah. uh, whether 
we talk about whether you, uh, so if, if I t if I t if I take the most sort of uh, well not provocative example, but if I, t if I take the, the, the Nazi regime mm -hmm. in um, in Germany, uh, Schacht is a very effective, very able Keynesian economist uh, who whose program was very successful in a short period of time in reducing unemployment from about six million to mm. two and a half in the space of two or mm. three years at the critical moment. Uh, now there are other factors involved, but but nonetheless, this was a clear goal which they had to show that they could produce these results. Moreover, Sharp persuaded Hitler that he had to pay a great deal of attention to the concerns of the big companies about innovation, which mm. Hitler had not been initially uh, in favor of doing, and, and, and training. So um, that, that seems one good example. Um, we don't really talk about Italy because we slightly, slightly wickedly call Italy, apologize about this, um, not an advanced economy in the 1920s. Um, anyway, we don't. But if you look at Mussolini's success, Mussolini also has very clear, he's, um, he's almost Keynes in avant, avant la lettre. If you look at what happens in um, Sweden, um, there you have, you have Keynesianism developing and that, as it were, damps down the, almost damps down these movements there. In Belgium, where you, you have populism developing along with, uh, along with socialism, this strange mm -hmm. and brilliant figure, Henri de Man, mm -hmm. uh, who is first initially the leader of the Socialist Party in Belgium during this period, uh, and is very able, has a whole Keynesian way of doing things and has this big plan for doing things. Now, he quite interestingly merges into a populist fascist mode and becomes a leading collaborator when the, when, when the Germans take over. But the, what, what goes on there and what, um, what de definitely uh, means you're, you're not just, you're not attacking advanced capitalism mm. is you, you have a Keynesian approach. So Keynes had a big impact, I think, directly and indirectly on enabling the um, populist parties, potentially populist parties, as well as the other parties, in seeing how to how to counter the depression. And what's really fascinating and really alarming at the moment is that we've gone through this prolonged period of recession, in large part because of austerity policies by governments which have been concerned to Correct the to reduce the um, national debt, national public mm. sector debt ratio, ratio, and that's been pretty disastrous for Keynesian for Keynesian reasons. So, why they get this wrong, um, I'm I'm not sure. It's clear that they, it's clear anyway. They can they persuaded the electors that they were trying to do the right thing economically, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. so I, I I think we are in a, just an incredibly difficult. Yeah. position at the moment. I do think on the other hand that when parties get close to government mm -hmm. they are concerned uh, about the policies they pursue mm -hmm. economically. One would have to say, I admit, that <laughs> neither, the, neither of the leading British parties mm -hmm. fall into, into this category and one might say that Trump doesn't mm -hmm. either. So, so whether there is a whether there's an underlying connection with a majoritarian system, uh, I'm not sure, but... Um, mm. Mm. I would, because that, I mean, that would be our, our next question about modern types of populism and how it ties mm. into your argument, because yeah, you're kind of saying now that the voters in times of recession are prospective, and vote for a party they expect to deliver better economic outcomes. Yes. So for a party with no brand recognition, which is in, in, your, in your book you talk about parties in SMD systems as cultivating a brand uh, connected yes. with uh, economic um, uh, good 
outcomes. So, so how is your um, your political framework in terms of uh, looking at the electoral systems? How does that tie into the types of populism you would you would get? So, so, so this, yeah. so, so if we say now, for example, that the, the populist voters in, in the United States might have made a mistake in voting prospectively for for a Trump economic program in the belief that that would lead to good economic outcomes, but would would you see a different reaction in PR systems, given that uh, economics and politics are organized in a different way? Well, I think that I mean I think in the um, in, in the PR systems, um, populist parties have had a choice between staying out and remaining challenger parties versus coming in and working out agreements. And if they want to do that, then they have to have a then they have to have a, a um, then they have to have a politics of, or an economic politics which makes them acceptable to the to the existing to the existing part of the existing coalition. Now, I mean, all I can all I can say is that um, the views of the of most governments in the last ten years have been, in my view, wrong as ways of developing um, developing the economy. Uh, I mean, I think there, there, there really are two. Two views about about this, and there's a minority view, which which has been quite a powerful view, but it's definitely a minority view, uh, and the, almost an oppositional view, which is that um, what doesn't work is having um, is having austerity policies in a period when there's when you start off with um, with with a bad with a bad shock, I, I can, if if we wanted to go into a little bit of um, an argument here, it's um, I, I think I think a number of uh, a number of economists would agree with uh, an economist at Stanford, Nick Bloom, who argues who's done a lot of work on showing that companies' expectations about the future depend on whether they've been through bad economic shocks. They don't depend, in other words, on rational expectations as, as decent economists would <laughs> hope to be the case. Uh, they depend on actually seeing what's, what's happened. Then the question is, if you think the future is going to be bad, how do you respond to that in terms of investing in innovation? Do you respond to that by increasing your investment in innovation, which is what should be happening uh, mm -hmm. at the moment? Uh, the answer is no, you don't. You, you, if you're uh, alarmed about the future, that's not the response which you, which you as a company have. So there is, I would say, um, a semi-opposition, uh, not the, quite the right word to use in all this ideological context which we've been using going back to the 1930s, but I would say that the this is this is a debate about what the appropriate economic policy is, uh, rather than a debate about are you in favour of economics or not in favour of economics. And I think the people who I think for a lot of politicians being in having a, 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 a sane economic stance is one which includes um, a pre. A, a Pretty austerity-based set of set of policies. Um, so I think it's going to be open to to, a lot to to parties if they so if they want to become part of coalitions in the eurozone area to or, um, or, or the I, I include Sweden in the eurozone area in the in, in, in a loose sense. Um, just as I would include Denmark and, mm. and Norway, um, then you need to have, to be acceptable as a party, you need to have um, a relatively uh, pro-austerity uh, approach, which has obviously been very difficult in, in, um, in, in, in 
in Sweden, but that's but something like that is the price for um, being in a coalition. So DPP has simply swallowed on on that in Denmark and gone gone along with it, just as the Greens in Germany have done the same thing and and the Social Democrats. And the only reason why the AfD hasn't done that as absolutely the leading thing has been that they've been a challenger party and haven't been actually looking to be part of a part of a government coalition. But if they were, yeah. I would expect them to do that, which I happen to think is the wrong thing to do. Uh, but they would doubtless go back to that awful professor who founded founded them in the first place uh, and move in a move in, in a direction of austerity if involved in it, and, and doing getting out of getting out of the euro is actually quite the same thing. Maybe for Germany to do something, they're not going to not be seen as a as a right for the right. Thing. Um, we thought that, um, or I think your book has been um, has has received a lot of uh, praise for being so optimistic yes. about um, the future of democracy, the future of um, advanced capitalism, yes. um, and I think that's very well taken. Um, but I think it's only true from the view of an advanced country. If you put yourself in the shoes of a not as, not so advanced country, the book is full of pessimism. Absolutely. Because it shows I can never make it there. Yes. But at the same time, there are some options in the book how to get to an advanced democratic capitalist system. Yes. And so my question for you would be, um, as you have been active in policy advice um, before, um, if someone from a not so advanced uh, country called you and asked, okay, what should we do? How do I become an advanced democracy? Yes. How do I become an advanced capitalist system? Is well, there any way? Is there a short track? What should we do? Well, let's first of all, look at the look at the history and see how it's how it's been done. So, mm. uh, let's say five countries which were not advanced countries um, in the 1950s have become advanced countries, namely South Korea, mm -hmm. Singapore, yeah. uh, Taiwan, um, Hong Kong, uh, and, um, and Israel. Just arguably, Ireland has, mm -hmm. but Ireland has done it very much just through the through American, through American FDI. The other countries have all had really effective, powerful governments mm. who have not been driven initially by, uh, by, by democratic voters wanting, um, uh, wanting an advanced economy, but have been driven basically by, by their leaders believing that they need to have an advanced economy. So that would be the most obvious thing, would be the Kuan Yu in. Mm -hmm. in Singapore as an, as yeah. a, as an example. Yeah. Uh, or actually in in, uh, in Israel, if you go back to the time of David Ben-Gurion and yeah. Golda Meir, uh, these were also leaders who believed that uh, you needed to have a, Israel needed to be a, become a powerful economy if it was to stand up to the situation it was in. And um, in part, these were all economies which couldn't, well, didn't have any natural resources to rely on, they, mm. they just had, they had to work out a way of, of developing. So what they did was to follow, f uh, I mean, the South Korea is the most as were, initial well-known example. It just simply set up, uh, set up big, these big companies. Um, mm. uh, it um, got a lot of help from Japan in terms mm. of technology. It put a huge, uh, increasing pressure on um, advanced countries who wanted to invest in South Korea mm. to, uh, to 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 not just hand over the technology but to train South Koreans to to work on the technology. And it then said to these companies, um, "We'll give you all the help you need in terms of finance. Mm. Your task is to." export and to do well in the export markets. That's going to be how our criterion for you. So you expose them 
to very severe competition, but you give them the resources to do it. Now that required a really top level, um, top level bureaucracy. But so this is both. The, this, is, this is that. Sorry, that was a single. That was a South Korean story. The yeah. Singapore story. The the one who gets actually gets multinationals to come and invest and set mm -hmm. up plants and so on in, in Singapore itself. Hong Kong, again, is slightly different because it's really the, that, that's, a, that's really encouraging the financial sector to develop on um, sort of UK type lines, so it's using that old, old linkage. Taiwan was a case, another case of a, a, a really, really able civil service working with connections between um, Taiwanese um, expats who had gone out to, uh, to, to Silicon Valley, who would built up businesses there, networks there, mm -hmm. and then came back to, uh, to, to Taiwan with a lot of help from the government, uh, but to build up the, the same industries in, in Taiwan. So yeah. these needed a, and the same, very similar story is true for Israel. These needed a highly able, capable government, mm -hmm. capable civil service, with leaders who had an absolutely clear ambition to to do this. So that's what's the mm -hmm. story so far. If you look at Latin America, yeah. um, on the. Uh, in nearly all the countries in Latin America, you have you have some sort of deal between Latin American governments and the big domestic yes. groupos, yeah. and the deal is um, we all we, we won't enforce competition policy in your mm. in your industry. You can you can make high profits. Uh, all we demand is some proportion of profits. A crude yes, approximation, yes. Yeah. which incidentally ties in with a sort of public choice, yeah. Jim Buchanan type type view of how capitalism develops in a in a distorted in a distorted way. So this is a difficult thing to do unless you have a government which is um, clearly enough in control that it can enforce this on. Um, on company can force companies to, to, to innovate and to develop yeah. in export markets. If it can't do that, then, then it's a very difficult thing to do. Now, the, this is all being made much worse by the Washington consensus mm -hmm. that it's very difficult to get hold of uh, foreign technologies, and particularly yeah. American technologies. And this is somewhat ironic since America developed in the late 19th century basically by getting hold of yeah. uh, actually British technologies yeah. and, and using them and putting up big tariff barriers so that, that uh, British companies couldn't, which were still that, still then capable of doing this, to compete in the, in the United States. That has made it really difficult nowadays to pursue a policy which, which is almost necessary to some extent, namely how on earth do you get hold of foreign technologies uh, if you want to if you want to compete. Mm. There is a third difficulty, which is that normally to build up a whole innovative system, you already have to have a lot of technological uh, university research institute resources mm. in physics, in mm. uh, physics, chemistry, as well as software engineering and biotech and, uh, and so on, and as well as already having a pretty or, or organized yeah. civil service system and legal system and so on. Now, you can do some of those, things. so if you take, if you take Spain, Spain mm -hmm. obviously has um, a reasonable uh, legal system, um, civil service, uh, yeah. and so on. It doesn't have a, it, it has a technological, but it doesn't have remotely the technological base which any of the advanced economies do, with the partial exception of um, Catalonia and maybe parts of the Basque mm. country. 
I'm talking a little bit off the top of my head here. But no, that's perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So here you have a country which is obviously a highly civilized country, mm -hmm. Spain. Um, though you may wonder what quite what they're doing with accusing part of the country of treasonous behavior and so on. But <laughs> there we are. Uh, these things happen. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they would prefer to have uh, Sanchez than, um, uh, than um, Theresa May as their as their leader. <laughs> um, so, so the only interesting, the only big change taking place is that we now can probably countries can probably take off on the basis of software engineering hmm. alone, or rather, you can do an awful lot with software, software engineering, if everything else falls into place. So that, so that would be my only, but, but generally I'm pessimistic mm -hmm. about this. Yeah, generally I think it's incredibly difficult for countries to, I mean they benefit, benefit all these things eventually trickle, trickle mm -hmm. down, but, but to actually move directly into the fast lane is a very difficult thing mm -hmm. to do. So the, so the story you described in the beginning of your book, about mm. the co-evolution of democracy and capitalism, it was only possible at that point in time. If you then the, the countries you mentioned now uh, that joined this club after the yes. Second World War, most of them were uh, auto uh, authoritarian states. Absolutely. And not only do you have to be the right kind of authoritarian it's states, the right kind of authoritarian states. And, and then today now, after I mean, in the ICT era, uh, era, you would need a third type of development strategy. Would that be? Right, uh, you'd, so mm -hmm. you can't follow the South Korean model today, and you, you can't, can't follow the British model today, but you have to yes. find a new model. So you, 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 you do. I think you do have to have a very powerful state which wants to do this. And just how easy that is for any modern state which isn't already pretty developed is uh, open to open to question. Um, even even if you took Catalonia, which would be quite a, quite an interesting example, Catalonia might be a, a place which could could develop, uh, and parts of uh, maybe parts of Spain as as well, but or Portugal maybe Portugal. But these are still a long long way behind in terms. Of you look at patent data; mm -hmm. they are a million miles away from 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 as it were what we might think of as a takeoff period. So I'm pretty. I'm pretty pessimistic about that. So this was partly, this book was partly written to say there really is a big difference between what our position should be in relation to advanced mm. capitalist democracies versus less advanced ones. Yeah. Could you envision uh, an advanced non-democratic capitalist? Uh, some some yeah. people are highlighting the, the recent successes of China, for example, yes. as, as another type of uh, model combining a, a certain type of political system and some type of capitalism. Well, so so China so China for a long time quite explicitly took South Korea as its uh, as its model to that you that if you have a if you have a, a, a strong enough government um, you can do something. You can do something like that, and uh, so I'm, I'm uh, whatever one's attitude to other aspects of the Chinese um, administration. Um, one can certainly say that China is probably the um, the country most likely to be able to to move things because it's got the biggest power to enforce uh, mm. advanced companies to give it to give it tech. To, to give it technology, but you're absolutely right. You, you have to. I think you have to have a very powerful government, which is which is saying. Um, uh, I think one could certainly accept that authoritarian governments play, um, as I see it, authoritarian governments play a major role early on in develop in moving to becoming an advanced economy. So I would say. This is really this this is sort of really difficult, a really difficult area because it because it, it first of all it's a lot of different 
different histories, what mm. I was talking about. I just came to say because of G Germany would be would be an example um, of, mm. of that. But actually, if you <laughs> if you look at the if you look at say uh, Baden and Wurttemberg in yeah. the last century, or if you look at yeah. the West Prussia along the yeah. along the line, they weren't actually um, they were not authoritarian. I mean, not in any serious way authoritarian, and yet they were actually where where the German economy, where a lot of part yeah. of the German economy yeah. developed. So it's it, it, I was I was so I was going to go and say actually a lot of the, having an authoritarian government at the start may not be a disadvantage, it may indeed mm -hmm. be an advantage, and I do do think that's the case, probably, but. Um, and I don't so, so I certainly don't want to root I certainly don't want to say what we're not saying is um, in saying advanced capitalism and democracy are symbiotic in mm. um, and reinforce each other in in advanced nations. Um, I don't want to say that was that was the way these things started. I think these things may have started in probably in a number of cases if I if I was really uh, if I really knew enough history to go through all the examples, yeah. Yeah. probably having a powerful government. One, so one reason to go back to the 19th century is um, you needed to, you need somehow to control landowners because landowners typically mm. had a lot of wealth and they had large labor forces and the process of industrialization Pulled, was designed to pull those labor forces into becoming getting enough education to then mm -hmm. move into industry. And the landowners, which is where a lot of wealth was, would pay for that. So it needs to say, you had to have a powerful enough government to counter mm -hmm. the interests of these conservative landowners who had no interest at all in their, in their peasants or, in inverted commas, serfs being educated, God yeah. forbid. Uh, and moreover, they then had to pay for it. So that would be an example of why you need to have a powerful mm -hmm. leader who can impose. So, so indeed in South Korea, if I'm right, um, there was a land, was a big land reform mm -hmm. in the 1940s or 1950s. Again, slightly off the top of my head. So one disadvantage of being an economist, of having been brought up as an economist is you say things off the top of your head with a tone of great authority, <laughs> and people accept what you say. Anyway, that should, probably shouldn't be on the. Uh, it was a bit of advice to people. Yeah. We'll, we'll cut it out later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but I think I mean this is a very, uh, very important, uh, interesting discussion that uh, I think I would like to talk more about maybe yeah. tomorrow. But I think we need to, to move on to, uh, to what, what yeah. we were mentioning uh, yeah. now about uh, being an economist, yeah. doing research yeah. in a in an area that's yeah. also populated by political scientists and sociologists and historians and I think for, for us as Max Weber fellows engaged in this multidisciplinary program it would be interesting to uh, to hear your opinion on uh, uh, your multidisciplinary career in yes. this sense. So, so, so maybe talk a bit about why you started to to collaborate across different mm. disciplines and, and how how it worked for you and what kind of challenges and difficulties mm. there were and one. Yes, well, no, believe it or not, I actually started off as teaching theoretical econometrics in the graduate program in Oxford mm -hmm. at the age of 27 or 20, 28. Um, and then actually went and spent some time doing that in, in Berkeley. Um, I think I got pretty bored. With it, I mean, I very much, I really enjoyed the mathematics of it at that at that stage, but um, but I got, I, I could just see that so many of the problems uh, of economic policy and so on were not being solved by by model building. That, however interesting it was, that wasn't the way of of, of solving them. Um, and Oxford was a good teaching environment because as a as an Oxford Don you had to teach a whole range of different in those days 
uh, it's become much more specialised since then. You had to teach a whole range of different subjects to your, mm -hmm. to your undergraduate. So you got to know these very, very clever undergraduates, um, and you taught them a lot of different, mm -hmm. different things. That was a great um, apprenticeship, as it were, but it went, I mean, I think I probably did it for, uh, well, I, I did it until I, until I went to, then went to, um, to Berlin to run one of the institutes in the Wissenschaft Central. Mm -hmm. And to do that explicitly on an interdisciplinary basis, when that yeah. that's why they persuaded me to persuaded me to go and do that. Pretty sharp, actually, from mm. a large point of persuading me to, to to do to do that. But before that, although I was teaching economics uh, and increasingly actually teaching macroeconomics, which is the one which is one of the really useful areas of of economics to to understand. Um, I was working a great deal on how unions worked, on incomes policies, on skills, uh, and so on. So I was combining economics, you know, combining macroeconomics with uh, with a lot of um, with a lot of sort of institutional. Mm -hmm very policy oriented questions and really coming to grips with having to come to grips with with um, with political economy and and some areas of, of political science. So mm. that's my that's my background and um, I, I've I, I certainly um, I, I certainly very much like the idea of being able to do economics, political science. But increasingly, discovering you have to know about most things. So I mm. read a huge amount of history um, mm. because I think not understanding, if you don't understand history, uh, I think that limits one a mm. great deal. So I've been reading um, reading a lot of Sherry Berman's mm. work because she writes so well about the history of all these things going back to the last century. Um, Katz Nelson is a marvellous mm -hmm. historian and political scientist. Um, Peter Katzenstein, mm -hmm. when he's writing about history, is is fantastic. So I've benefited a lot by reading a lot of a lot of history. Um, I've also benefited increasingly, as I was saying earlier, by the fact that um, there was a very strong group of economic geographers in the in the LSE. Hmm. Um, uh, Simona Yamarino, um, Andres Rodriguez Posse, uh, Crescenzi, uh, and some very good younger younger ones. And a lot of what I've been finding myself trying to work on or hmm. we've been trying to find we try and do things together. We've been trying to find to, 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 to work on has been all to do with uh, in recently about the agglomeration of cities. Where do people come? Where do what's the um, lifetime trajectory of a young person who's born in quite a backward hmm. town? If they're able, how do they go to? Where do they go to university? And when they go to university, where do they go after that? Uh, origin teaching, yeah. destination analysis. Yeah. So um, that I found <clears throat> tremendously useful. I found the whole big literature on innovation, which is um, uh, also really useful. I went and um, I went and taught several courses at the at uh, Santana in mm. Pisa. Uh, where Giovanni Dozzi is. Um, Giovanni is a, uh, he's made a whole lot of, uh, as I say, breakthroughs in the way in which Ramon should analyze technology regimes and innovation and and so on. And I've, there, are, there are a number of, a number of people mm -hmm. like, or close to Giovanni, I mean, like Chris Freeman, who, uh, who died recently, who's, who's a very fine theorist. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lundval, um, 
working on social systems of innovation um, down that path also. These people who uh, themselves have started off maybe from sociology backgrounds, maybe from te technical technology backgrounds, who've combined history, economics, a really depth knowledge of how innovation works in different mm. different countries, reading reading that. Um, mm. And then of course I've, I've done a lot of I've done a lot of um, political science. I mean, so mainly the actual serious political science I've done has probably been game theory, but that's because that was just my comparative advantage. <laughs> I've been pushed into a political science department in, in Duke. But um, anyway, to, to cut a long short story short, I couldn't do the sort of work I do mm. if I didn't have a whole number of different disciplines that I could call on, but I would even say um, to, have the, to have the nerve to read things which professionals in different areas mm. have written, and then just use it. So that I think is really, is really yeah. important. I think the, I mean I'm afraid universities are going in a terrible direction at the moment, and I mean LSE which sort of prides itself on being interdisciplinary, but if you actually look at each of the departments, they are completely discipline-based departments, yeah. and we have this um, ref system, this uh, yeah. external review system in the uh, in English academic life, <laughs> where you you now you you get you get rewarded essentially by writing um, very good discipline-based mm. papers in the right. You have to be in the right journals and so on. And the whole thing is set up on a disciplinary basis. So everybody says interdisciplinarity is the most important thing in life, and nobody or very few people practice it. So I think that this means that we don't we don't do much interdisciplinary work, but actually most serious questions are interdisciplinary. Nor do we do big picture work. And we don't do big picture work because most, if you work in a discipline you're working on a precise area, so you don't look at big picture questions, mm -hmm. yet most of the important questions are big picture questions. So, um, I mean, I hope that, I mean, it's, it's really it's really difficult to, to know what to, to advise someone. It's mm -hmm. somewhat different between different countries. In the UK, if I'm really advising someone, I'd say, um, Look, if you want to really make progress, you first of all have to get a disciplinary home. You have mm -hmm. to establish yourself as very good in a discipline, mm -hmm. and then so you can move from there. So multidisciplinarity is a luxury of uh, tenure. It, it is a luxury of tenure. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. actually it's mainly even a luxury of uh, having <laughs> having got to old age because <laughs> <laughs> being able to be and not having to worry about. Um, Returns, as it were, in the in terms of academic, mm. academic. I think it's a real. My view, it's a real crisis. And um, I mean, all one can say is there are, even among economists, there are a lot of really clever economists who do actually, at a certain stage, understand that one needs to behave, to work in a pretty interdisciplinary way. So George Ackerloff is a mm. good example of that, and Joe Stiglitz is an amazing example. Uh, of that, um, so I think some very clever people do realise the limitations of their own disciplinary uh, backgrounds and try and and try and get out of them. But I don't think. It, but but it's but but it should be that young. It should be that we have a way. We have a way of teaching this to young people. We don't have. We don't mm. do. We don't do that. Now, that may be different in some places, but it's not terribly. It's not terribly obvious. Mm. It also is pretty close to our final question, actually, um, which was, um, oh, what can I say? You partly answered this already, because um, our final question was, uh, it could be the case that, let's say, I'm a master student and I'm reading this book, and then I think, yeah, I was in South case, they have it all covered. It's, it's all, they have all the answers already. So what's left? Um, what do you see as the major open questions 
in, let's say, a political economy, or to formulate it differently, if I, or if you were a PhD student again today, what would you do your PhD about? Well, of course, you're perfectly right. We've solved all the intellectual. <laughs> 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 um, uh, so I'm not sure what I'd what I would do it about. I, mm. mean, I think there are really interesting. I don't want to. Um, uh, I want to talk quite a lot, lot if I, um, I mean, maybe there, maybe tomorrow, about how families work and mm. um, partly how families work. It's obviously closely related to, to, to gender and what the relationship is between the way advanced capitalism works and the way aspirational families work. And very few people have really worked on this, but it's very clear that, that there are a lot of families, who, in, perhaps most families, who are deeply concerned about their, what their children do. And they want their children to be educated in a way which enables them to get good jobs. Mm. Um, I, mean, I see this with lots of our, lots of our young friends, um, but I see it much more widely than just than just that. So this is one area which um, I think that political science has not really thought about enough. How does the family come into 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 all this, we tend to think either of broader economic interests, or we think in terms of um, uh, individuals <coughs> and the in interests of individuals. And um, there's, I mean, there's interesting feminist literature on mm. um, on the household and partners in a in a in a household. Um, but the feminist literature actually is, is, I mean, it's very interesting, it's very interesting literature, and, um, but it doesn't actually relate to, it doesn't relate very much to, advanced, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously, obviously I'm really interested in advanced, <coughs> advanced capitalism. Mm. So that's one area. I think a second area is the whole way in which the, in which um, <coughs> Asian economies mm. work. Um, as I was saying, I've been to playing around with uh, looking at Singapore but um, as, a, as an example of a very differently organized system to to our systems in in uh, Europe or the United States there's interestingly relatively little populism in East Asia says that I mean, partly you, you, you don't have to be too populist you might get put in prison but if we leave aside actually getting put in put in prison by, by, by governments it's a really interesting question that mm. populism hasn't been a major theme in mm. these in these countries, and part of the reason, I'm just uh, very loosely suggesting, may be that you have pretty look pretty non-corrupt civil services, um, which are pretty also very very able civil services, and people can see that they are. By and large, doing doing things more in a general interest than in a specific interest. Mm -hmm. that, that may be that may be exaggerating, but but that so that's the second area which I which I think is really mm -hmm. is really interesting, um, and I think that I think innovation is just going to become yeah. more and more interesting. That that people working, for instance, uh, people working on autonomous vehicles, and how does that then completely radically alter if once that starts to come about, how does that radically alter the way we mm. live our we live our lives when we can um, when we is it when we have an hour more a day? Are we getting another really interesting question is the four day the four day week sort of on the one hand it's yeah. absolutely it just seems such an obvious thing to happen. But if you think about it as a massive complex coordination game, namely getting everybody, because you more or less, you can't have some people working on Saturday and some people, people working on different days. What's great about the weekend is everybody agrees that that's sort of, very broadly speaking, a period when you don't need to be in the office. So you'd have to, you'd have to people talk about four-day week, but 
the actual problems of how you do it when we need so much work, work if I'm uh, work, sorry, working quite a lot on, on service sectors within big, mm. big, big cities people need to interact mm. the whole time mm. so you can only have a four day week if you actually agree that, that, that we're going to have one day, one day more of the week where people don't interact the whole time, mm. that stay at home or don't go into their offices so there are very, I mean I think there are a number of, mm. if one looks a little bit ahead, I think there are a number of really interesting questions mm. to to work on. I don't, I, so I think there's, I think there's every, everything to go for as it were. <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, inspiring uh, end of this very long interview and uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here and we're looking forward to your talk tonight. Good, mm. very good. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Yes, okay. good. <laughs> good, good, good.